value is in the eye of the customer. It's whatever they perceive the value of your product or service to be. Perception becomes reality. The second that you put that out there, perception becomes reality, okay, for your customers. So if they think or they believe or they perceive your product to be invaluable or then, yeah, they're going to pay whatever, right? They're going to say, oh, yeah, $300. Yeah, we need that. That's great. We'll pay for it. But if they see you saying, hey, our product's $300, but today it's only $3, it's like, "Mm, is that product really worth $300 then? Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the marvelous Hannah Acosta. Hannah Acosta is the passionate and purposeful leader of the social media department at Ugly Mug Marketing. Over the past four years, Hannah has grown her department by over 340% and has worked alongside hundreds of small business owners and entrepreneurs as they navigate the ever-changing digital marketing landscape. Her key focus is helping businesses build predictable marketing systems that consistently produce leads and sales. After launching more than 4,000 social media campaigns, Hannah has had a front row seat to the challenges and rewards faced by marketers today. From private clients to social media masterclasses, Hannah brings her expertise and energy as she teaches clients how to use social media to scale their business, generate leads, and achieve results. Yay, Hannah, you're here, and I get to ask you my favorite question, which is, what do small business owners need to focus on this week? What a great question. I love this. I think probably a lot of small business owners get overwhelmed by that question though. They're like, what do I need to do today? What do I need to focus on? I've got a million and one things on my to-do list and I can't even keep up with all the things. But my recommendation for the number one thing they should be doing is turning their Instagram and Facebook likes into email list subscribers. Ooh. Yes. Because here's the reality, y'all. You do not own your Facebook page. No. You do not own your Instagram account. No. You cannot call the people that like your page unless they have already shopped with you or purchased from your business or experienced your service or whatever it may be. So if tomorrow you were to log on to Facebook or you were to log on to Instagram, and this happens all the time, but yep. if you were to log on, And they say, just kidding, you violated our policies. You are now banned from this platform. Or, whoops, we accidentally deleted your page. So sorry about that. And you have thousands and thousands of people who like your page. Or heck, it could even be just 500 people who like your page, but that you have extreme influence on. Come on now. That sucks, right? That totally blows. I've spent more time in Instagram jail than career criminals have spent in normal jail. Like I I sneeze (laughs) and wind up in Instagram jail. I'm like, what the heck? And my favorite thing about Instagram jail, I don't wish this on anyone. I've talked on the podcast a whole lot about my uh, opinions of Facebook and that I wish uh, Facebook and Instagram will get a divorce, but I love Instagram. I love Instagram dearly, although Instagram does not love me. I go on, it says, you can't do this right now. This meaning anything. And yeah. it says, you are suspected of violating our terms of service or guidelines or whatever. If you believe that this is incorrect, sorry, tell us. And there's a button that says, tell us. And let me tell y'all listeners across the world what that tell us button does when you click it. 
absolutely jack shit nothing i have sat there and clicked that thing like a little kid on an elevator go up button i seriously was like come on come on come on come on it's like tell us tell us tell us tell us i did nothing and i you're right it took me at least a week in each iteration to get back on the platform and yet what i didn't do is any kind of driving to them off of the platform. And what I also didn't do, honestly, is ramp up my non-Instagram platforms like my email. So double bad on me. Shame, shame. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, and it's so stressful because you can't pick up the phone and call Facebook and you can't pick up the phone and call Instagram. And if that is where you are primarily, or if that's the only place you are communicating with your customers or your prospects, well, you're in deep trouble, right? And so we have to move those page likes or those people who are engaging with your content on either one of those platforms. We have to move them to an email list, right? We we want to have them in a place where we have their name, we have their phone number, we have their email address, heck, maybe even we even have their address or their zip code or some other piece of identifying information so that we can yes. continue the relationship with them off of social media, right? We are not just dating our customers on social media. We are taking the relationship to the next level and we're going to emails or we're going to text messages. We're moving into other platforms so that we actually own that information. They've willingly given us that information and we can continue the relationship and nurturing that. Are y'all hearing that a social media person, a social media genius expert person is telling y'all to get off of social media? Are you all like it's it, I think sometimes in this dance of should we do social or should we do email? And it really is a both. Because it's a one-two punch, like you're talking about, like we can keep people in social forever, but we're probably not going to convert them or at least not convert them nearly as well as we would in the old standard, aka email, right? So I think sometimes it's really easy for everybody, especially if they're really pouring a lot of love and attention into their social and get a lot of their dopamine from social to not be like, oh, hold on, let me connect with these people on a deeper level. So where do you think this like anti-email grumpiness has emerged from? I think it's because of all of the spam emails, right? I think it's the, I think the attitude comes from, gosh, I don't want to rat out companies, but I'm just like, okay, like Bath and Body Works. Rat them out. I'm on Bath and Body Works email list and I'm just like, stop sending me coupons. (laughs) Yes. Why do you have, you have nothing else to say different than you sent me yesterday or Bed Bath and Beyond. I'm just like, please stop. Like maybe once a week, not every other day, not three times a week. Like, come on, like, give me a break. This isn't even anything of value. And so that's my challenge to small business owners and entrepreneurs is that if you are providing valuable educational content and not every single email is buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. This is why I'm so great. People want that content in their inbox. Okay. Okay but they don't want you blowing them up trying to be all salesy all the time. There has to be a blend of educational, engaging, um, video even video content where we're taking them to our video page or we're taking them to our YouTube. We have to have more than just sales content going out in emails. And I think the negative Nancy attitude comes from those businesses that just simply aren't doing that. They're not nurturing relationships. They're just selling their product and sending us coupons that we may never use. (laughs) Which is the same gripe we have about DMs on social, right? Where we're like, oh, Instagram is so spammy now. LinkedIn is so spammy now. Y'all, there's spam everywhere. Totally. Drive down the highway, you're surrounded by spam on both sides. In Chicago, going toward our airport, we have 87 billion of the same billboard about the fact that Brian Erlacher has hair now. Like literally <laughs> we have like 80 of the same billboard 
word or damn close, maybe like a two word copy difference. If that's not real life spam, I don't know what is. We just kind of got to tune it out and focus on what we want. But just because we email doesn't mean we spam, y'all. Just because we email doesn't mean we spam. So how on earth, you got me all riled up now. How (laughs) on earth, Hannah, do we ask people on Instagram to follow onto our mailing list? How do we convert a like to a lead? Yeah. Wow. Love that. Taking likes to leads. This is how you do it. Write that book, the new book by Hannah Acosta coming (laughs) early 2023. Watch out world. Here I come. (laughs) Okay. So taking a like from a lead, I actually just taught a webinar on this this morning. We have a 10 step framework for taking those page likes and page engagement, whether on Instagram or Facebook, and turning it into an email list, turning those people into leads, right? Step one is knowing who these people are, right? I'm going to talk in terms of an example. One of our clients came to us. They had 13,000, 13,000 people liked their Facebook page. Damn! They had another probably, I don't know, 2,500 people following them on Instagram, okay? When they first came to us. Not too shabby. Right? I'm like, hey now, this is great. Like you, I'm not even starting from scratch. You already have this loyalty and this following and you've already been consistent showing up for your people and they love the content and they love you and they love your coffee shop and bakery and you know, come on, this is great. Well, then we asked them how many people they have on their email list and it was 250. And we're like, damn it. What? Like, what is that? Like, no, 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 no. You're having a birthday party and you didn't invite any of your friends. Totally. Totally. That exactly. And so we said, okay, well, we have these 13,000 people or, you know, 15, if we're including, um, if we're including Instagram, we'll call 15,000 people that we can easily take from Facebook and communicate with them and continue nurturing, nurturing that relationship within our email. How do we do that? We do that through Facebook slash meta slash Instagram, whatever you want to call it, people. Slash gag me with a spoon. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, We do that with their lead generation feature within Ads Manager. Okay? Mm. So it's a little more of a technical approach, but it's a shortcut to just adding it in your stories every day, sign up for my email list. It's a shortcut to having a link in bio. It's a shortcut to adding it at the bottom of every single post. So then now there's like, you know, this call to action you have to put on everything, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense, right? It's an evergreen ad that you can launch and you can run periodically every week, every month. You can run it every other month. You can turn it on when you feel like it, when you have extra budget in your marketing funds, whenever, okay? This is an evergreen ad that you could create. And it is this. At the top of your email lit or at the top of your ad, you say something along the lines of, hey, are you a fan of blank? Well, of course we know they are because within Ads Manager, we are going to target people who already like our page or we are going to create a custom audience of people who have engaged with our page or content, watched 50, if we're, uh, if we're someone who creates a lot of video content on our pages, we can create custom audiences of people who have watched 50 to 100% of our videos, 75% of our videos. You can select which videos it is that you want them to have watched in order to be pre-qualified for this ad. But that's the audience that we're going to create. And we're going to say, hey, this is essentially the low-hanging fruit, right? These are the people yeah. that it's like, they, they're already drinking the Kool-Aid. They love yep. us. They love our brand. They've seen us. They've shopped with us. They've been in our restaurant or gone through our drive through whatever it may be. These are our people, right? So it's easy. It's an easy ask. At the top of your ad again, hey, are you a fan of, I'm going to use my client, Little Cakes with Big Attitude. Are you a, cl- or a fan of Little Cakes with Big Attitude? Oh, of course you are. Well, then you are not going to want to miss out on joining our subscriber club or whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah. Then we're going to list some benefits of being a member of this list or joining our email list or being a part of our club or being a subscriber. So this is where you have to get into the mindset of your customer. What is it that 
they really care about? Why is it that they love you? What is something that's going to entice them? What's going to be an actual compelling offer or incentive for them to actually want to take action? If your call to action is join our email list, that ain't it, y'all. They want something in return. Okay. When you sign up for our email list, this is what you're going to get. When you become a little cakes with big attitude club member or whatever, you know, here's what you're going to get. So in the example of little cakes with big attitude, we give them, we collect their birthday and we give them a free cupcake on their birthday. And we have that all automated and set up through their MailChimp account, which I'll get to in just a second. They get behind the scenes kind of sneak peeks and special emails from the owners, Bridget and Robin. Bridget and Robin really don't show their face a ton on the Little Cakes with Big Attitude platform, but people love them. And so we take advantage of the fact that every single month, they're going to get some level of personal email or message from Bridget and Robin in addition to whatever else they've got going on. Then they're going to share the flavor of the month and what flavors of the week they've got coming up and all of that fun stuff, right? But they're going to get this special exclusive behind the scenes note from Bridget and Robin, which is exciting for them. And then as an additional thank you, we're also going to give them a 15% off coupon, but they have to use it within a certain window of time. And we don't say like 24 hours or anything unreasonable like that. I think we give them like... Within the next four minutes, you have to be craving a cupcake <laughs> right now. <laughs> exactly. We may not be open, but we want you in the drive through <laughs> So we give them these things because we've learned that this is what they care about. This is what they want. This is what's going to incentivize them to actually want to sign up for our newsletter, right? And then we measure the success of that because we say, okay, well, how many people actually came in and redeemed this? How many people actually came in on their birthday and redeemed this? And we can track that in their POS system and we can tell how successful it is, right? Right. But taking people from Facebook to your MailChimp account, or maybe you use, gosh, another email marketing platform that I can't even think, Constant Contact. Constant you know, Contact. Uh, I use Kajabi because that's where my courses are held. Like yeah. anything that's going to have some good segmentation, people. Totally. Totally. That's where we want them to go. But how do we get them there? The manual way to do it is every day you go into your ads manager account and you go click how many leads came in. You click download. You manually upload them. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? So we use Zapier. Good old Zap. Come on. We love it. Sponsor this podcast, Zapier. Come on. <laughs> I, I love Zapier. I'm just like, I'm a walking billboard for them. I'm not sponsored. I have no code, but I'm their biggest fan. Okay. So Zapier has a feature where you can connect your Facebook leads from whichever forms you choose. So for us, it's our email subscriber form for Little Cakes of Big Attitude. And it will take that lead and put them into MailChimp for us. Now, on the back end side of MailChimp, we've got tags. So if someone fills out that form, they get tagged as Facebook lead, and then they get added into these other sequences. Then once that tag is added and the automatic email with the 15% off coupon fires off, we don't even have to think twice about this system. And I will tell you, it is the exact same copy. We maybe refresh the picture up a couple times a year. But it runs periodically, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 150 bucks. The budget changes, but the results do not change. We ran this campaign in January and we got 67 new people onto their email list, just running it in a month, for 42 cents a lead. Come on. Not only that, if the email list was like 250 before... That's like a 25% increase, if not more. Yeah, in just a month. For 42 cents a lead. And the reason for part of that is because they already like your stuff. Totally, totally. They don't even have to have liked our page, but just be interacting with our content. And it's such an advance. Like, people get stressed out about social media because they're like, oh, I got to go do this and then I got to do that. And then I got, no, 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 no. How can we make evergreen advertising content? How can we build out systems and processes so that we can turn it on and turn it off and it works without us having to do the busy work? And this campaign is an exact example of that. That's magnificent. We've set this up one time 
And again, turn it off, turn it on. We have extra budget this month. Not, not enough this month for that. We'll skip it for a couple months. It's phenomenal. And what it's done is directly impacted their business. A lot of times on social media, we don't see the conversion between like to lead or like to money in the bank or like to button seat in the, the restaurant. It's very, very difficult to make the connection from social media likes and followers and engagement to more revenue in my business. Because you can't specifically say it's a direct result of social media, right? We can't say, hey, that birthday party came and sat down at my restaurant and ate our delicious pizza because they saw such and such on Instagram or on Facebook. It's very difficult to make those connections. It's very difficult. And so what lead generation campaigns allow us to do is say, hey, we were targeting people who were engaging with our content on Facebook, people who already liked our page. We invited them to join our email list. And now we can directly track that customer through our POS system or through our email marketing system to see who is actually making purchases. And therefore, we can also tell what the lifetime value of one of our customers are too, right? Come on, that's invaluable data and information. And it helps us make better decisions for our business. It helps us make better decisions with our marketing budgets. Because I will tell you, I will tell you that during COVID, when COVID hit, the cost per lead on Facebook tanked because all of these people, the first thing to go was marketing budgets. And we're like, (laughs) what are you doing? (laughs) Why would you do that? They're like, oh, but we have to keep the sales going. I'm like, do you not realize that marketing and sales are directly intertwined with one another? Marketing impacts sales. Sales impacts marketing. We have more testimonials that we can And they're not the same damn department. People don't even get me started. Oh No, but they feed each other and they invest in each other and return in each other. And that's just how it freaking goes. I love that we're talking about this right now because the U.S. and other parts of the world, but certainly the U.S., has this looming, like, will we or won't we have an epic Mm -hmm. recession right now? Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing similar behavior to what you're talking about with COVID, where people are going, well, I got to tighten up this and I got to tighten up this. They're still doing other stuff, but they're slowing down their marketing. And I'm like, y'all, y'all, y'all. Recession means market more, not market less. Mm -hmm. And your dollar is probably going to go further right now, too. Exactly, because your competitors are freaked out and not doing anything. So you may as well take full advantage and sleep better at night because you'll know that you did everything you could to combat the recession that day. But I think that's, that's huge because it is, if we don't have a pipeline, we don't have a business. Totally. Even if we have current clients, we don't have a future business. When that client graduates from us, we don't have a business. And I see that all the time where people will be so focused on the clients they have, especially over deliverers. You know, they're so consumed by the clients they have. Mm -hmm. And then those clients, they come to a expected end of a program or an unexpected end of a program and they go, okay, who's next? Nobody. No. Oh, shh. (laughs) <laughs> they're all hanging out on Instagram, right? Like, yeah. ah, so we got to use the Facebook leads, Facebook lead gen feature on ads manager to get them off of Facebook and Instagram and into our MailChimp constant contact Kajabi or other email platform. And yes, I always am having people come on and say that they are the biggest fan of something. I am not Zapier's biggest fan. I bow to you on that one. (laughs) But I think we should get some hoodies or stickers or something for all the love we've shown today. Just saying Zapier. Exactly. (laughs) Which the Canadians call Zapier, which I also really love. They're like, oh yeah, I can use Zapier. And I'm like, why are y'all so much cooler than us? You're only one border away. Oh my God. Um, So much cooler. Zapier. (laughs) Zapier. But wouldn't that be funny? We're like, we love Zapier. And Zapier's like, no, it's Zapier. Like, I don't care what it is. We love it. I hear all the time from people too. They're like, I don't know how to automate. I hear all the time that I need to automate. I don't know how to automate. Start your automation adventure on Zapier. Totally. It's, it's insane how much 
I use it for. So another one of my clients Mm -hmm. is an HVAC company and they own about 60 different uh, HVAC locations across the Gulf Coast. Okay. So we have a lot of leads coming in from a lot of different places. Okay. It's the Gulf Coast and it's HVAC. Like, (laughs) come on. It is hot. Okay, y'all. Yeah. Hot and humid. You got to get that dry function on those ACs too. Exactly. So as their leads come in, we have it set up through Zapier where the lead comes in, it gets dumped into their CRM. It also gets added to a separate tracking spreadsheet just as backup. And then it also triggers an email that goes from me to the customer service representatives at each location saying, Hey, just so you know, this Facebook lead came in. Here's all their information and here's what they're interested in. Thanks so much. So it eliminates all of the work of having to download that lead. We send it to the customer service rep, the customer service rep, adding it to the spreadsheet, then them going in, adding it to the CRM, blah, 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 blah. Guys, 60 locations. That's a lot to cover. That's a lot of spreadsheets. That's a lot. I am the Google Sheets queen too. Sponsor me, Google Sheets, please. Come on. Sponsor me, Google anything (laughs) at this point. I love it. We're like, and now we will plug ourselves to sponsors. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. What are you doing? Someday. Someday. I've I've had like, okay, who haven't I picked on in a while? Canva. Get in here, Canva. Yeah. Come on. Come on, Canva. Kajabi. I already name dropped you, Kajabi, and MailChimp, and Constant Contact. What are y'all? Give me some money to run this show for all this free advertising you're getting. <laughs> Damn. But, you know, I'll email them from my, well, no, I can't email them from my email list because they're not on it, but I'll email them. Anyway, so Facebook, we've talked about. If we use the Facebook lead gen feature, will it pull people from Instagram that have engaged with our stuff or is it Facebook specific? You can create custom audiences based on your Instagram subscribers as well. And then you could run that same ad on Instagram and on Facebook. Rad! Okay, fantastic. A lot of our listeners, understandably, considering this is a podcast, are podcasters. How would you hack that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful strategy or if if you would change anything at all for growing an email list for a podcast? Ooh. So would this person already have social media established or they're just getting started? I have a feeling that that it's more established. So similar to Little Cake's Big Attitude, best freaking name, by the way. Uh, similar to that, where it's like there's some social established, but not driving to email. Mm-hmm. Because that's the thing about it. podcast metrics is that they're so disparate, right? We have like our Spotify and our Apple and our Stitcher and our blah, 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 and our other blah, 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 and our Pandoras and our blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, I could see the advantage to having a way to remind people cross platform, regardless of platform, that the podcast exists. Or if they're already liking things like the podcast page, getting them over somewhere, right? But like, what do you what do you think? What's coming up for you when I ask that? So someone that comes to mind is Amy Porterfield. So she yep. is a digital marketing course creation guru, right? And I absolutely yep. love following Amy. And one of the things that Amy has been talking about, or she's been showing me lately mm. by doing is mm. every time Amy releases a new podcast, she also sends a link and a quick description and the podcast cover to her email list. So if you are a podcaster and you already have an engaged audience on Facebook and or Instagram, and you target those listeners or or excuse me, those followers there, get them to subscribe to your email list through the Facebook lead form, but then strictly tag those people as interested in your podcast so maybe your ad has something to do with tune in, get the latest episode of our podcast. Here are the types of topics that we cover. And then that way in your MailChimp account or in your constant contact, you would be collecting their information. And the only information that you would want to send them is stuff spe- like specifically getting new episodes delivered directly to their inbox. Because I think a pain point for people is there's so many podcasts 
And when you log on to Spotify or you log into Apple and you search in business and you want something that's social media related, so many different things pop up. And I'm like, I just want to be able to go one place and click and listen to what I want to listen to. So you can in turn be solving a problem for them, right? They don't have to click around and be searching for your podcast on Apple or in Spotify or wherever else. You can just get it delivered to their inbox the second that something gets released, whether you release two shows a week, one show a week, one show a month, whatever it may be. So that would be my recommendation. Just because I see Amy doing that, I see other people doing that, but Amy's one that I'm specifically subscribed to. And I'm like, that's really interesting. I also saw that she recently just launched a secret podcast that you have to subscribe in order to get that content. So that's so cool. I'm like, that's cool. Makes people feel like they're in too, right? It makes yeah. it feel exclusive. Well, especially with someone, a, a network as big as Amy's and someone with as much brand recognition as Amy, at that point, her followers know that on a good day, they're going to get a fraction of a second of her brain, right? Not not saying from her content. I'm saying like her actual attention. So yes. anything that's offered with increased access to Amy or increased learning from Amy is going to galvanize action toward and around it because people know that she is so in demand. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hi, Amy. Sponsor this podcast. Yeah, exactly. Hi, Amy. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> hi, Amy. I'm not creepy, but I love you. <laughs> hi, uh, hi, Amy. I am a little bit creepy, but I, I also love you. And and my creep is just fangirl enthusiasm. I cry on celebrities. It's real gross. Uh, wow. Okay. Thank you, by the way, for giving these tips so generously, so completely, and in context of real clients so we can see start to finish how this campaign works. I am just so excited because I'm a strategist and I love strategies and you just laid that out freaking gorgeously, just freaking gorgeously. Just because I got to ask and, and I've already disclosed that this company and I have a weird relationship. What? the ever-loving F is happening with Facebook and Facebook pages and their algorithm. I mean, they're not for us anymore as small business owners. That much is clear. But I still am told there's a bit of a disconnect from what I see as a business owner. I'm not a marketing strategist anymore. I exclusively teach sales. So I'm not even going to try to put on that hat because it's rusty. Yeah. But as a small business owner and as a small business consultant, I still hear a whole lot of pro Facebook, pro Facebook, pro Facebook, not talking about the ads, which we know are the best, unfortunately. Damn it. But like, make sure your group is still on Facebook. Make sure your best content's on Facebook. Make sure you're doing Facebook reels, uh, not just Instagram reels. Like Facebook, is it make it a comeback? Did it ever leave? Is it slowly dying? In your opinion, for solopreneurs and mom and pop shops, how much of our effort should we be putting on Facebook? I know that's a broad stroke, but go for it. I think it's very dependent on your target audience. Yeah. So for example, my HVAC client, we are targeting people who live in the South, who are homeowners, who maybe have a system that's a little older, not someone, we're not really targeting anyone who just bought a new construction and has a brand new train or lovely carrier system and the whole nine yards. No, we're not doing that. We're not, that's not who we're trying to get, right? So we're potentially targeting someone who's a little older, someone who bought an older home, mm -hmm. someone that's probably between the ages of 35 and 55 or 60 is who I'm after, okay? That person is not on TikTok. That person is maybe still on Instagram, not towards those older ages, but probably that 35 to 45, they're still on Instagram. I mean, hello, like all of these influencers and moms and all of that, they're hanging out on Instagram, totally making, making yeah. their cute Instagram reels with their children. And we know they're on there. Okay. But they're not on TikTok. They're not on 
we have to go where our people are hanging out. Okay. That's what I always tell them. I'm like, where does your target audience hang out? Like, where do they spend their time? Are they on Snapchat? Well, then we need to get on Snapchat. We need to be doing something on Snapchat. Like that's where our best efforts should go. I'm not of the belief that you need to be on all platforms and be all things to all people. I'm a huge proponent of having worked through a customer avatar worksheet of some sort and done that exercise so that you specifically know who your people are. Whenever someone comes to work with us and they say, oh, well, we just really cater. I used to have this uh, vehicle accessory or we still do work with them, but vehicle accessory, window tint, lift kits, you know, wheels, tires, all that fun stuff. Okay. Trick out your truck. Yep. They used to tell us, you know, really 16 to 65 and up. And I'm like, ah, no, ah. no. Who has the most money? Who's picking up the phone and calling here the most? Who, demographic-wise, who is completing the biggest tickets or the most amount of tickets? Those might be two different answers. You know, you can have multiple customer avatars. You can have, you know, maybe three to five different segments of people that you are targeting. But the majority, who are the majority of people that are engaging with your content, purchasing your product? experiencing your service, whatever it may be, right? Like, and then we need to do our research. So there's a website called Statista and you can go on there and you can Ooh. see, hey, uh, what, what's going on on Facebook? Like what's the latest stats on Facebook? You know, is it mostly women or is it mostly men? And are they between the ages of 25 and 35 or is it really 35 and up? You know, who's playing on what pa- platforms? That's how you make a decision of when, where you're going to spend your time. There might be a secondary platform where you choose to promote your your product or service and your biz, but especially for solopreneurs, we don't have time. We do not have time to be on Facebook and to be on Instagram and to be on LinkedIn and to be on Twitter and to be on Snapchat and to be on TikTok and to be on YouTube. Uh, Hello, we do not have time for that. So where can we maximize our time, reach the most amount of people and the best people who are actually going to convert from like to lead? I'm using that now. Let's trademark it. Come on, (laughs) right? I'm just like, ooh, put it down, put it down. I'm telling you, y'all, we named so many books on this podcast. It's not even. (laughs) All right. So uh, I'm a little hungry because you mentioned something that I was like, ooh, I could eat. And then I thought about it for a while. And now I'm just hungry for leads. Uh, I'm like, give me those leads. But (laughs) instead of stopping right now to go launch my new ads, I'm going to do the world a service by continuing to interview your brilliant brain and ask you this question. What the heck does any of this gorgeousness have to do with the Netflix show, Somebody Feed Phil? Y'all, don't even get me started on Somebody Feed Phil. (laughs) I just did. I just did get you started on somebody feed I film. could go on and on and on. So somebody feed, feed Phil is a show with a man named Phil. So Phil is actually the uh, producer of Everybody Loves Raymond, which who hasn't seen Everybody Loves Raymond? I love Everybody Loves Raymond. I mean, it was on TV for a million billion years. Like yeah, there's like 1700 seasons of Everybody Loves Raymond. It's like Seinfeld. Okay. It's classic. It's timeless, okay? So Phil's the, the, the producer of Somebody Feed Phil. Fun fact, Phil is married to, if you're an Everybody Loves Raymond fan, Amy from Everybody Loves Raymond, who was Robert's girlfriend or wife. That is actually Phil's wife in real life. Okay, now we're just, that is some trivia right there. Truly. So we're talking about Phil Rosenthal. I yes. looked his name up. Yes, Phil, Phil Rosenthal. Phil Rosenthal. Philip Rosenthal and his wife is named Monica Horan. Yes. And she played Amy and everybody loves Raymond. Yep. All right. So Phil travels all around the world just in search of interesting food and really though the best food. And it's not always at like, you know, a Michelin star restaurant though. And then one of the episodes is just watched. she does go to South Korea and he does eat at a two star Michelin restaurant, which you know, bucket list for me if I could ever afford. But I just love watching him go and experience different cultures. He's just this goofy, 
man. Like <laughs> he's just this goofy New Yorker who's like from the Bronx and like Jewish family. Like he's just such a character. And I love just watching him go and experience all of these new places. And it really inspires me to like want to travel more too, because yeah. my husband and I, we love to travel. We just went to Jamaica. We did, um, Maldives last year. Like we love, my husband was in the army. He was stationed in Italy. He did Malta, Germany, like you name it. He's been there. Okay. My husband's like way cooler than I am on the travel scene. Like I'm like, I need more stamps in the passport. Well, that's because of the military. <laughs> like give yourself a little credit. You weren't stationed in all those places. <laughs> I know, but I'm like, gosh, so much. Your passport is so much cooler than my passport. But anyway, so it's just a really fascinating show to see him go again try all these different things. He meets up with like his celebrity friends who like just so happen to like be like visiting or in town or like chefs that are really like world renowned chefs and gets like to go behind the scenes in the kitchen and how they do everything. It's just amazing. And the food, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like he goes to Oaxaca and Mexico and like, I'm like, these tacos look next level like next level tacos. Okay. I'm like, this is insane. I'm like, and then he's in, I can't even remember. I think it was in Singapore. Maybe he had octopus or something. I was like, I've never had octopus, but I'm feeling inspired. Like, let's go. Like I got booking my flight to Singapore. Like, let's go. Right. Yep. And then he's walking yep. around with an actress from crazy rich Asians. And it's just like, it's just so wildly entertaining. And I cannot, I cannot stop watching it. I might start going back and rewatching. It's really that great. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I mean, that's an endorsement. So how can we market the way that Phil eats? Oh my goodness. How can we market? So Phil, he has a great Instagram because he's just, he really is, I think, as authentically goofy in the show in like real life. Like I really think he's being like truly himself. Okay. He's got a book coming out where he's sharing you know, stories from all of the places that he's been, but there's also recipes, which uh -oh. I am trying to get my hands on that book. Okay. So for him, I think that's going to be massive. Like, I think even if somebody hasn't seen the show, they might be interested in cooking in general and want recipes. Like I'm such a recipe book collector, which is oh hysterical for how often my my husband and I like eat out. But it doesn't matter. You don't have, have to food. make them. You just have to look at them <laughs> and know that you could make them if you chose to make them. I just open it up and I'm like, that looks so good. Let's go out to yep. eat. <laughs> yep. yep. So, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see the way that he chooses to market the cookbook, Somebody Feed Phil, and what he chooses to highlight and feature from that. I'm really envisioning some Instagram real action, which also, side note, I know there's this huge revolt against Instagram and everyone and their mother's mad at Instagram because of what, you know, their founder or, you know, not founder, but their chief of Instagram, whatever his name is, what he said about short form video and how reels are here to stay. And that made people upset. But for Phil, I think it would be so interesting to have these mini cooking sessions with the chef who created the, the recipe or in their kitchen, or maybe he's cooking the recipe that's in the book, or he's showing little snippets or behind the scenes reels of that story that's featured in the, in the book. I just think that would be brilliant on his part. Heck yeah. Well, and now I'm like, what he could do is he could put an ad on Facebook using the Facebook lead gen feature of Facebook ads. And it could say, do you love somebody feed Phil? If so, get on our mailing list for a recipe. Yeah. <gasps> oh, I just learned how to do that from you. Come on. Ba -ba -da 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 -da. And then we can link it out. And then all those people that we got interested in this one recipe from the book that we're giving out for free, then once the book is released or once we start taking pre-orders, then we sell to that list, right? Yeah. We're like, you want more recipes? Come on. Then you want this book. And we give them a discount or we just sell, sell them on it really hard. I do not believe that a compelling offer, side note, 
And this is for all the solopreneurs, especially those who this is your side hustle and you want it to be your full-time gig. Compelling offer does not equal free or discounted. Okay. Thank you. Oh my God. You do not have to give something away for free that you put your blood, sweat, and tears, everything, you. time, your energy, taken away from your family or whatever, from your friends in order to build this thing. No, that is not what that equals. Compelling offer does not equal free or discounted. Y'all, I'm going to go tattoo that. <laughs> on my arm for the amount of times that I'll be like, people come to me like, my sales are terrible and I don't know why. And I'm like, you're over discounting. Yeah. They're like, that's a thing. And I'm like, yeah, you're taking your price point and telling everybody it's a joke yeah. or a suggestion. You're devaluing right? what it is you're selling. <sighs> exactly. Exactly. A gajillion percent, just a bazillion. And and even to the example before where we were talking about uh, Little Cakes in Big Attitude, still the best name ever. <laughs> Sponsor my podcast. <laughs> but even in that example, like the free birthday cupcake, if you're a service provider, do a service add-on. You can still get money in the door if you get a service add-on, right? Like if you're a coach or a consultant, add on an extra follow-up session or a series of worksheets. If you are a practitioner, add an additional add-on service to the manicure that someone is getting from you. It does not have to be a discount. It can be educational. It can be educational. It can be edutainmental bowl, bowl, bowl. Like, I, you know, it could be anything, but it does not have to be bargain basement. So I am so grateful that you brought that up because nothing gets me cranky like people that just want to throw a discount at things. The value is in the eye of the customer. It's whatever they perceive the value of your product or service to be. Perception becomes reality. The second that you put that out there, perception becomes reality, okay, for your customers. So if they think or they believe or they perceive your product to be invaluable or then, yeah, they're going to pay whatever, right? They're going to say, oh, yeah, $300? Yeah, we need that. That's great. We'll pay for it. We That's exceptional. But if they see you saying, hey, our product's $300, but today it's only $3 or we're giving away this amazing discount for the next, you know, 60 days or whatever it may be. It's like, oh, is that product really worth $300? Then? Is it really value? Is it really that valuable? You know, it's like, yeah. Perception. How is it worth $300 tomorrow, but not $300 today? Like I just, mm -mm. well, and I love, you know, that we're bringing this up in the context of, of somebody feed Phil, because I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to watching it, but I can almost guarantee you that what we don't see on screen is Phil arguing with uh, chefs and restaurants about pricing, Absolutely comparison not. shopping, looking for pricing, <laughs> filtering things on Yelp by dollar sign. He's not doing any of this. No, he's he in wants search to for eat the best. what he wants to eat, and he's in search for the best. If you pride yourself on being the best, why are you selling yourself like the worst? Phil wouldn't even find you. Nope, sure wouldn't. Phil wouldn't even find you, right? Or like, that's the other thing is I really, really doubt that maybe they don't show him getting the bill or maybe they don't even charge him. I don't know. But I guarantee Phil's probably not going in and going, oh, well, <laughs> I mean, with the exchange rate in <laughs> Singapore, I paid $12 less for these oysters. Like, I don't think he cares. No. I don't think that's what he's after. He's after the best. How does Phil involve or showcase the the makers of this food? Like you said, he's telling stories about them and with them. But I'm so curious, in, in your opinion, how is he showcasing them? And is there a lesson in how he showcases them for us on, on how we show up on social? I think he is really great at not making it about him. He's making it about them. And that's such a lesson for business owners on social, right? It's not about us and why we're so great or why our company is so great or why, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about 
our customers and the experiences that they have and how we helped them out when their HVAC system went out and how happy they were when we arrived on time and in the middle of the night when their unit went out and they've got a crying, screaming baby and it's 92 degrees outside and 102, you know, humidity or whatever it is. That is what it's about. That is what you need to be doing on social media. And so there was this episode where Phil goes to Portland and he goes to the chef's house. The chef in Portland has added onto his garage and created a restaurant where people can come and dine in for dinner. And it's all connected to his garage and in his backyard. And you know what is happening in this entire episode? His son is just like, this this the chef's son is just running crazy all around. He's jumping <laughs> into the camera and smiling, and and he's bringing Phil and his dad a beer, and it's just like it's fun and it's just organic. And he's just letting yeah. he's just like I'm a fly on your wall, right? Like yeah. this is your oh, world. Like, I love let me that. let me come in and see what a day in your life is like. You know, I'm here to try your delicious food, but. How did you get this started? Why did you start your restaurant in your in your garage? And so he goes on to tell a story of how it came to be and you know how he was spending so much time at the restaurant, not enough time with his family. And so now this is an opportunity where it's like, hey, it's in the garage, it's in our backyard. My kids are here, my wife is here, you know, they're the servers and the waiters and the whatever, you know? And it's just really, it's just really cool because the show really is not about Phil at all. It's called Somebody Feed Phil, but it's really more about the somebody than it is How about Phil. gorgeous is that? Yeah. I think that's a beautiful metaphor for all of social media. Totally. We're, we're telling folks about us, but we really should, or at least really could, be saying something about us yeah. together. And there is a book a really great book called Know What You're For by Jeff Henderson. Also a fangirl for Jeff Henderson. Uh, Jeff Sponsored Henderson. Sponsored by podcast, Jeff Henderson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, he used to work at Chick-fil-A. He was a pastor. He worked for the Atlanta Braves, like tons and tons of marketing experience. And in his book, Know What You're For, um, he asked the questions, what are you known for? And what do you want to be known for? And he talks about being for your customers. And one of the examples that he uses in this book is he talks about Johnny Swim, which, oh, I love Johnny Swim. They're a great band. Anyway, um, but he also talks about the company Chubbies, uh, which is a swimsuit, you know, men's yeah. short short. You can get the whole family matching swimsuits, you know, company. And he talks about how on their social media, yeah, you're going to see some styled shoots, but you're mostly going to see a lot of memes. And a lot of customer images. They're not yeah. worried about the aesthetic of their, you know, feed. People are wearing the products. They want to show that the products are being used as directed. Totally. And so the one of the images that was on there was like this dad and like his little, you know, three-year-old boy wearing the swim trunks. And it's just this like real photo from this family on their vacation, probably in 30A somewhere. Rosemary Beach, mm -hmm. you know, but it's just like, yeah, those are real people. And then they not only use those people's photos, but they tag them in it. And then these people feel special. They feel this yeah. even deeper connection to the brand because not only did Chubby's go and find that picture and comment on it and say, hey, we love that you guys got these matching swim trunks. We're going to share this too. And then go back and share it and tag them. It just builds this like, relational thing. And that is what people forget on social media. They forget that it's social. They forget that you can yes. interact with your customers, with the people that like your page. You actually get to talk mm -hmm. to them. It's not like a billboard where you're driving down the road and someone makes a comment in their car. You don't get to talk to them when it's a billboard. You don't get to talk to them when it's an ad in the midst of them binging some show on Hulu. You don't get to talk to no. them in the middle of an ad on Spotify, but you get to talk to them on social. You get to talk to them when they tag you in their stories. You get to talk to them when they tag you on the post in their feed. And not enough people are doing that because they're busy making it about them <laughs> instead of about Once the you talk to them, you can put them on your email list. You could ask them with consent. 
Yes. Can't put themselves on your email list. Let me be very clear about what I just said. Yes. You can put them on your email list means they can put themselves knowingly on your email that you are up to all anti-spam acts on and GDPR and have easy unsubscribe access. That's what I mean by you could put them on your mailing list. All right. I got two more questions for you. The first one is you with all your cookbooks, Phil shows up at your house and Phil needs to be fed and Phil only wants to eat the best. So what do you cook the best out of all the things you cook? Oh my gosh. I am making Phil either. I'm making Phil one of two things. We are making my grandmother's enchilada recipe. I'm sold. Which I have typed up um, as a PDF on my phone. So I'm actually making that tonight. So I'm feeling really there you inspired go. by that. Yes. So we're making enchiladas, okay? Or we're making my cousin's recipe for a creamy tortellini soup with spinach. Yeah. You might have to stay overnight, Phil. That sounds like two <laughs> magical meals to me. Yes. Take that soup frozen to go. I love it. And also, I, I, I would eat both of those things. So, you know, maybe it'll wind up being Hannah Feed Annie. Yeah. Uh, there we go. All right. So if our listeners want more of this brilliant strategy brand of yours, given so generously, so freely, and they want to hopefully, ideally, throw some money at you for this brilliance, what is the best way for our listeners to come into your world and start a conversation with you? Yes, they can find me on LinkedIn. They can email me directly at hannah at uglymugmarketing.com. They can go and like us at Ugly Mug Marketing on Facebook or on Instagram, shoot us a DM. Those are probably the best ways to get connected with me. Now, once you reach out and you're like, hey, let's chat social, there's a lot of different things that we can do, okay? We can have you as a private client and we can take over all those responsibilities of posting in all the places, whether that's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, maybe you need help on YouTube. We can help you with all of those things, right? We can also do some consulting. So if you're like, hey, I want to learn and I want to feel empowered and I want to know how to do these things on my own, you and I can meet, have a monthly meetup, a little coffee, chit chat for an hour every single month, twice a month, three times a month, every single week for X amount of however many months you need me. Whatever your goals you want to accomplish, I just signed with a lady who is, owns a catering and picnic company. So fun. Hey. So she and I are going to be chatting uh, two times a month and I'm going to be teaching her how to implement the lead generation strategy for her business so that she can grow her email list and create a sales funnel there. So that's going to be super yes. fun. So if you want to be hands off and just pass the torch over to someone, we can do that. I can help you with that. Okay. But if you want to learn, I can also help with that with help you with that too. And you can grab some coffee and knock it all out. Okay. So those are going to be the best ways. Now we also have a three day lead generation master course that is currently on sale for $97. It's essentially three and a half hours worth of video content where step-by-step step, I walk you through how to create that audience and ads manager, how the heck to get into ads manager. First of all, if you're like, <laughs> If you're like, I don't even know what that is. That's me. I'm like, it used to be on the left. Now it's on the bottom. And then it's on the right. And now we got to click here. And before it was called Ad Center. But that's a different thing. Yeah. yeah okay. Y'all pay the $97 just to figure out what button to click. Okay. Totally. Totally. <laughs> so we can get connected there too. Whatever you prefer. <laughs> fan freaking tastic well hannah it has been an absolute delight having you on the show today thank you for this wonderful strategy thank you for your fabulous advice and uh brain and thank you for introducing me to somebody feed phil yeah of course i hope you get the book too we're gonna be cooking <laughs> All right, y'all, we're going to have the cooking challenge, the first TLTQ cooking challenge coming to you sometime when the book comes out. So stay tuned for that. But right now, I will be back in just a second with my final thought and your homework for this week. We're going to get social. Well, hey there. I've been thinking a lot about what I would serve Phil 
And so far, my best guess is pass an easy pesto, secret family recipe, over angel hair with grilled salmon if it's a warm season, or my out of the world mushroom soup if it's a cold season. I know these recipes like the back of my hand. I could make them in my sleep if only I had the ingredients in my house, which I don't. So if Phil showed up unannounced right now at my house, he'd be receiving yogurt, Diet Coke, and an entree of Velveeta shells and cheese and old taco shells. I am not ready for Phil to find me, even though I'm totally worthy of a visit and work hard to grasp his attention. Y'all see where I'm going with this wildly stretched metaphoric scenario? This week, in addition to the brilliant email and ad combo strategies that Hannah laid out, your homework is to look at the places you make your first impressions, your social outlets, your landing pages, your approach at networking meetings, you name it. What's the very first thing people think or feel when they learn of you or meet you? What's the very first message they receive when they opt into your world? What kind of DMs are you sending back to people if they're bold enough to reach out. Is it Pasanisi Pesto or is it the Velveeta? Because you only get one shot to feed Phil before he's on to the next best thing. We can't control where or when quality leads find us as much as we would like to, but we can control that they leave satisfied after that very first bite. Hey, thanks for listening. If this episode kept you laughing and learning, I have two requests for you. First, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button, depending on your platform, so you never miss an episode. And also, more importantly, if you are looking for support, inspiration, networking, collaborations, or just a chance to hang out with me, Annie P. Ruggles, and our fantastic guests, make sure that you are a member of our LinkedIn community, The Legitimati. It is a weird and wonderful place place. I can't even believe it's on LinkedIn and we want you there. You'll find the link in the show notes. Big shout out as always to the fabulous dudes who helped me make this show. My producer and editor, Andrew Sims of Hypable Impact, my theme composer, Riley Horbasio, and my show art creator, Francois Vigno. See you next time.